Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kim Layton, and I'm the Executive Director of the ITCON Clinical Simulation and Innovation Center in Doha, Qatar. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for asking me to join you here today. Attending this conference has really been a nice break from the World Cup activities. I was asked to talk to you about evaluation of simulation facilitators. Now, I've been facilitating learning with simulation for over 20 years now, and evaluation of simulation environments is a topic that I'm really passionate about. I don't have any disclosures related to the content of this presentation. I am a director at large for the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Now, let me start by asking you, are you a good facilitator? Now, whether you answered yes or no, how do you know whether you're good or not? Have you had any kind of formal evaluation of your abilities? Or is your answer based on learner evaluations? Perhaps you look around you and you see people that aren't really doing as good as you are, so you have to assume you're a good facilitator, right? Now here's the truth about me. I think I'm a good facilitator of simulation. I'm a certified healthcare simulation educator at the advanced level, which is a certification through the Society for Simulation in Healthcare. But you know what? I've never had a formal performance evaluation done of my ability to facilitate learning and simulation. I've also never had just my regular teaching capabilities evaluated. Now, when I first decided to teach and leave clinical, I was an ER nurse, and I realized I didn't really know if I could teach or not. I didn't know if I could stand up in front of a room full of people and actually talk and organize something that made sense. So I started helping with our hospital-wide orientation program, and that gave me a set topic to talk about every two weeks, which really helped me gain some confidence. Then I decided I needed to have some more clinical focus if I was going to teach in a nursing school. So I began teaching on the side in a community college program where I helped licensed practical nurses gain skills in nasogastric tube and intravenous catheter insertion according to their curriculum. Now as a final test for myself, I taught ocean animal life to my mom's third grade students. After that, I decided if I could teach third graders, I was probably just fine to teach in a college. But I had never been taught how to teach in a college. I was first assigned to do classroom teaching, skills lab teaching, and take students to clinical. Simulation was added later. Now, sure, there was a little bit of orientation for how to do my job but not once was I ever evaluated on my performance. Now, because I wanted to grow in my professional role, I entered a master's in nursing education program, and I was really excited. I thought, well, here's where I'm gonna learn how to be a teacher. But really, mostly what I learned was how not to teach. I learned a little bit about curriculum development, but still, nobody taught me how to actually perform as a teacher, and nobody evaluated my ability to teach. Now then, long story short, I was sent to learn about simulation and then became the lead for integrating simulation into our nursing program. Now, okay, so this was 2003 and there wasn't much help out there yet. So I learned from other people who lived close enough that I could travel to their sites and mostly I just learned by trial and error. Now here I am 20 years later, and I've still never been properly evaluated on my teaching skills. This is not how it should be. Now, some of you may have been nodding your head when you were listening to my story because most physicians and other healthcare providers are chosen to be teachers because they're good bedside clinicians. What we know is that is really comparing apples to oranges. Just because you can provide good patient care does not mean that you can be a good teacher. We've all experienced that. 
It's really two completely different skill sets. And mostly we teach how we're taught for worse or for better. Now, complicating our ability to evaluate simulation facilitators is a relative lack of valid and reliable instruments to do so. So think about the clinical evaluation instruments that you use for your learners. Have they been validated for the level of learner that you're working with? Do they produce reliable data from which to evaluate the learner? If you don't know, then you're like most other healthcare educators. This really is a difficult area to create evaluation instruments for because of the subjectivity of the evaluators and the difficulty in really defining exactly what is it that we're trying to evaluate. <clears throat> now transfer those thoughts to a facilitator evaluation. What are the qualities of an expert educator? What are the qualities of a competent educator? What's the difference between the two? Now, I'll tell you about the development of the facilitator competency rubric and some of the challenges that I discovered while we were creating this. I used to work for a nursing program that had 22 campuses across the United States. Because each campus had a simulation center, we needed to teach the facilitators how to facilitate learning with simulation. Most of them had little to no experience. So we developed a program to go out for two days to every campus, even knowing that's not enough, but we needed to start training them in facilitation skills. However, we were only given four hours at each campus. And we all know you can't achieve competency as a facilitator with four hours in any kind of training. So we decided that we needed to develop a train the trainer program but realized we really had no way to evaluate the effectiveness of this program. How would we know if the training worked and how would we know if people became competent? So we set out to develop a rubric that differentiated levels of competency for a simulation facilitator. We developed the rubric based on Dreyfus and Dreyfus's competency framework of beginner, advanced beginner, competent, proficient, and expert. We identified our major concepts of facilitation as pre-briefing, preparation, facilitation, debriefing, and evaluation. And this was based on the literature. During a four hour pre-conference workshop, we worked with a large group to determine what each section of the rubric would look like for a beginner, competent, and expert facilitator. You know, what are those characteristics that I asked about before? We then took the tool to six major simulation conferences to first help establish the validity, but as important, we wanted to know if people would actually use this tool. Because creating a rubric is a lot of work. <laughs> But everybody was really excited about the tool and we finished the validity with an expert panel. Then came the easy part, or so we thought. Even though our 22 campus presidents and the 22 sim lab leaders supported the tool, the facilitators would not agree to participate in the reliability study. Now we had already piloted this instrument during our training, so they, they were familiar with it. And we did a lot of pre-work on psychological safety too, but it just didn't matter. So despite all the begging and conjoling and pleading, after one year, only one person had participated in our study out of a population of hundreds. So after a few sleepless nights, I went back to the IRB and asked them to allow me to collect data nationwide. Now, my fears of being overwhelmed with data were completely ridiculous because still only a few people participated in the study. So I again overcame my fear and I asked the IRB if I could open this study up to the world, every nursing school in the world. 
But after another year of data collection, we still did not meet the minimum sample requirement for our study, but we had to finish it. It had already been two years. People were still asking, they wanted to use it. So our final sample size was 107. In the end, in the data, we were able to differentiate between the beginner, the novice, and the expert levels. I'm sorry, beginner, competent, and expert levels, which was our original goal anyway. We essentially wanted to know who needed help, who was competent already, and who was at the expert level so that they could do the train the trainer courses. Now, when the study was over and I was talking to people, I, I asked the question, you know, why didn't you want to participate? And I got a lot of feedback that people just did not want to be observed. So I, I really should have done another study to, to explore that further, because I certainly had a big sample size for that. Um, but it really got me thinking, you know, we don't ask our students, our learners permission to observe and evaluate them. It's a standard part of their formative learning process. So what's distressing to me is that we don't hold ourselves to the same standard as we hold our learners. And even worse, we could be failing our learners because we're just not good enough facilitators to help them complete the simulations correctly and to learn from them through the debriefings. Now, when I talk about simulation facilitation, I do want to be clear. I'm talking about a variety of modalities of simulation facilitation, like task trainers, low fidelity mannequins for simple skills, or high fidelity mannequins for activities like evaluating clinical judgment, critical thinking, prioritization, communication, you know, as well as objective structured clinical examinations or OSCEs. In order for our students to be successful, we have to be good facilitators of learning. So how do we get there? I think there's several ways and they all require us to be proactive in ensuring that we have the proper skills to do the facilitation of learning for simulation. One is that we can use existing facilitator evaluation instruments, such as the facilitator competency rubric and the DASH tool, which I've hyperlinked with a QR code from this slide. The DASH tool was developed many years ago by the Center for Medical Simulation at Harvard, and it's been used extensively. It's a tool that's been validated and produces reliable data all of which you can find out more about on their website. Now, this tool focuses on pre-briefing and debriefing by providing different criteria that can be observed by the facilitator in those two roles. The tool can be used as a self-evaluation or other facilitators can do the evaluation. Even students can evaluate the debriefer. This is something that you have control over. The DASH tool is free, it's easily accessible, and it only requires that you initiate the use of it to evaluate yourself. The Facilitator Competency Rubric, or FCR, is also free, easily accessible, and only requires that you initiate the use of it to evaluate yourself. Now, this tool can also be used as a self-evaluation or other facilitators can do an evaluation of you and your skills. Now, I've mentioned that both tools can be used as a self-evaluation. That's really not the best way to learn how to be a better facilitator. The literature says we tend to evaluate ourselves higher than other people do, and we could really use an unbiased opinion, which we're not going to get from ourselves. So I encourage you to build one or both of these tools into the evaluation program of your simulation lab. Both are designed for facilitation of mannequin-based simulation. I encourage you to build in performance feedback into your train-the-trainer programs 
and any facilitator development program that you do. Honestly, I've only recently started doing that, mostly when I decided that this was really such a huge problem. We have a two-day workshop for facilitator development that has 10 learning modules online prior to attending a workshop. We have our learners complete the facilitator competency rubric themselves as a self-evaluation prior to beginning the modules. Then we have them complete the facilitator competency rubric again before the workshop. This allows me to see what did they learn from the modules. So it's knowledge-based, it's not performance-based. Then we have them complete the facilitator competency rubric again after the workshop. Again, it's knowledge. Now we've continued with this self-evaluation model mostly because I haven't had the staff to be able to conduct these types of evaluations. But we have now added an additional three hour workshop specifically for debriefing. There's no didactic portion to this workshop and it's entirely additional practice for what they learned in the facilitator development workshop. And this was added based on learner feedback because they kept saying they needed more practice time than we were giving them in the two days. Now, during this workshop, while each participant is practicing, the others are evaluating the debriefing skills using the DASH tool. Now, they're still very beginner at their debriefing skills, but this does give them a baseline. So then they know what areas to continue to work on and, and where to prioritize. After the workshop, we encourage them to ask any of our simulation center educators to evaluate their facilitation and or debriefing skills, either in person, or we can also record their sessions for later review. And I really highly encourage people, including everybody in the audience, to get recordings of your debriefing, recordings of your facilitation style, and then you could self-reflect on your, on your performance after you watch the videos. And you can do that using the DASH tool or the facilitator competency rubric. It, you know, it's like debriefing. When you reflect on your performance, it helps you see those areas for improvement and helps you process um, where, what went well and what didn't go so well. So it's fairly recently that master's and doctoral level programs in health professions education have become more popular. And maybe some of you in the audience have been able to attend these programs. However, we're finding that in those programs, as well as nursing education programs at the master's level, there continues to not be an assessment of performance requirement to evaluate the teaching capabilities. Now, I, I honestly don't know about this part of the world, but in the US, you have to have a full semester of student teaching before you can even teach kindergarten. Now, during this time, you're evaluated by your supervising teacher, the principal, as well as your college course instructor. And this is great. Teachers should be evaluated. There's a lot you need to know to teach kindergarten. But what I don't understand is why a kindergarten teacher needs to practice teaching and a college teacher does not. It just makes no sense to me. So if you're part of developing a health professions education program, I implore you <laughs> to add a performance assessment component to your courses and your program. To teach people how to teach without evaluating whether they can actually do it at the end of the program, I, I just don't understand that. Now, if you're a student in one of the programs right now and there's no performance assessment, take the initiative to ask your instructors to evaluate your performance. Be an advocate for this missing piece of simulation facilitation, as well as in general medical education. Lastly, I encourage you to review the Healthcare Simulation Standards for Best Practice for Professional Development, 
I've included the QR code on this slide so you can easily find it, but you'll also find them with Google. This standard is really important because while most places seem to be able to find at least even a little money for equipment, there's little to no attention being paid to supporting faculty development. But as this standard says, as the practice of simulation-based education grows, professional development allows the simulationists to stay current with new knowledge, provide high quality simulation experiences, and meet the educational needs of the learners. There's three criteria for this standard. And again, this requires that you take initiative for your own learning. So number one, do an educational needs assessment of yourself. What are your gaps? What do you need to learn? And then develop a plan to fill those gaps. Number two, seek out the professional development activities that you need in order to fill the gaps. Create your own learning outcomes. Look at your roles, look at how you fit within your organization, and then go out there and find the professional development activities that you need. Now, especially since COVID, more opportunities have become really easily accessible online and at a lower cost than they were before the pandemic. And lastly, reevaluate this professional development plan on a regular basis so that you can provide your own evaluation of growth. But I really encourage you to evaluate one of the tools that I talked about to see if, if it can fit into your plans so that you can get feedback from other people as well. We don't know what we don't know. So it's important to seek out the opinion and advice of other people into our performance. Since I mentioned the healthcare standards of best practice, I would like to point you in that direction as a great starting point to enhance your learning about simulation. Now, these standards first began in 2011 when I was president of the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, also known as INAXL. These standards are considered living documents and are now in their fourth edition, which was just published in 2021. There are 10 standards of best practice, all of which will help you become a more solid facilitator of simulation. There's standards for the professional development that I already mentioned. There's one for pre-briefing, simulation design, facilitation, the debriefing process, operations, outcomes and objectives, professional integrity, simulation enhanced IPE or interprofessional education, and evaluation of learning and performance. Now this last one is solely focused on evaluation of the learner. It is important to know that the first criteria for the facilitation standard states, effective facilitation requires a facilita facilitator, let me start that again, Effective facilitation requires a facilitator who has specific skills and knowledge in simulation pedagogy, further supporting the need for faculty development. Please do feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you might have. I appreciate your time and attention and I'm happy to field any questions that um, you might have. And thank you again for inviting me today.